Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Monday, October the 6th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are in attendance with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. Ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Katati. Council Member Davis. Council Member Moffitt. And Council Member Shul. Uh, this evening we have the distinct pleasure of recognizing one of our colleagues. Councilman Steve Shule, and I would ask Ms. Mary Henderson, Chair of the North Carolina Recreation and Parks Association, if she would join me. She's present. Are you right behind me? Okay, that's good. Steve, if you mind joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening to everyone. Um, I was honored to present our Distinguished Legislator Award to Council Member Steve Shule in Wilmington recently at our annual North Carolina Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources um, um, Association 
uh, annual um, conference. And this award, re award recognizes an elected official of a federal, state, county, or municipal government body who has demonstrated an outstanding contribution to the general field of recreation and parks on a national, regional, and or local level. And Council Member Shull was selected for this award because of the passion for open space and recreation that he has demonstrated during his tenure serving on the Durham City Council. And most notably, Councilman Shull's efforts were instrumental in the recent approval and the inclusion of a one half penny tax in the city budget to address deferred maintenance of the city's parks and greenways. And of course, I understand that it was a unanimous vote and that the entire council should be commended for, for that vote. So thank you very much for your support of Parks and Recreation. Council Member Shull has also coached youth soccer for over 20 years, some of you may not know that, and championed the Community Trail Watch Program. He is a regular user of the trails and is even known to challenge staff and citizens alike to join him for runs. He serves as a city council representative to the Open Space and Trails Committee. Currently, Councilman Shull is working with city and business leadership to raise funds to develop a rails to trails project that would link several neighborhoods to downtown and to other trails. He is an active representative to the Recreation Advisory Commission that I just understand you call RAC, attends special events, and was a visible supporter during this um, uh, Rhonda's department's successful CAPRA visitation for national reaccredi reaccreditation in 2013. So before I ask um, Council Member Shull to come forward and we represent this award and I'm so happy to be able to recognize him tonight, I would like to recognize a few other folks I think who have been instrumental with parks and recreation in the city of Durham. Um, I'd like to, rec represent, to recognize RAC, our Recreation Advisory Board, and committee, and I think some of you are here, if you could please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much. And, and as you know, and many of you know, that these citizen board members um, volunteer their time, they tirelessly work for the committee and for the citizens representing them and um, working toward improving their lives through Parks and Recreation Service, so thank you very much. And, this, this group, our citizen um, board members, are an integral and important part of our North Carolina Parks and Recreation Association, so thank you so much for what you do. I'd also, of course, um, be remiss if I um, didn't mention and commend Rhonda Parker and her staff in the city of Durham Parks and Recreation Department for the fabulous job that they are doing. And, you know, they work every single day for the citizens to improve their lives and to bring better quality of life to Durham. So I commend them for the work that they've done. In fact, I've seen Rhonda at a few conferences recently, and at each one of those, she and her staff are wearing out the carpet to accept awards for the great work that they are do doing here in Durham. Um, also, as you know, it, it takes a lot of folks to, to be successful. And I'd also like to thank on behalf of, um, I know Rhonda would like me to do this on behalf of um, parts and recreation of those other staff in the other departments that are so important to parts and recreation who, who really make a significant impact to help meet that Durham parts and recreation um, mission. So I want to thank them and recognize them for the work that they do as well. And now, um, Rhonda, do you want to do the With great honor and pleasure. I'm here to present this award. It's the North Carolina Recreation and Park Association Distinguished Legislator Award to Councilman Steve Shull, 2014. This is in rec recognition of an outstanding contribution to the field of recreation and parks on a national, regional, state, and or local level. Congratulations. Thank you. The Mayor Pro Tem likes me to speak for a long time. Uh, this is the first award I have received uh, since I received the Daughters of the American Revolution Patriotism Award in high school. Uh, it's, uh, so what I will say, Ms. Henderson, is 
it, it's kind of embarrassing to receive an award when I have such incredible colleagues. I, we have, I have the most amazing colleagues, and they are so supportive of Parks and Rec and all the essential services that we're providing to the city. But thank you so much to the uh, North Carolina Association of Parks and Recreation, to the Department of Parks and Rec for nominating me. Uh, it was quite an honor. The, the hardest thing about this is getting up at 7.30, to be at, at the 7.30 in the morning Recreation Advisory Committee meetings. That's the hardest part of the job. I'm never there on time, but the other members all are. Um, parks and Rec, you all know, we have 60-some parks, 33 miles of trails, got swimming pools and spray grounds, got high ropes courses and rec centers summer camps and classes and everything from Pilates to crafts, trips for seniors, open gyms for kids, the Parks and Rec, they're the folks that hire the refs and line the fields and put up the nets and make sure the soccer balls are there and recruit the coaches. It's an incredible, incredible task and uh, we have a wonderful Parks and Rec department and they, they're on the front lines of what we do here in city government every day and do a, a wonderful job. So I just want to say thank you and uh, express my appreciation, and I'm, I'm really honored. Thank you. Steve mentioned his uh, committee meeting. Uh, as mayor, I have the opportunity to appoint and recommend various council members to various committees that they serve on. Uh, so when uh, I knew Steve was a avid sportsman, love recreation, soccer, and all that stuff. And so when I suggested that Steve maybe you want to serve on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, uh, he didn't hesitate. But after he found out what time they met, then he had a, <laughs> a few more charm. But he, he's, he's a great person and does a great job and certainly is deserving of the recognition that he's given tonight. Uh, this evening, we also like to recognize some of our young people. And when, when I say that, uh, as some of you may or may not know, we've had a program for, for many years uh, which focused on trying to provide opportunities for work for young people in our community, particularly during, during the summer. Uh, initially, this was pretty much driven at the city level, but uh, we since merged, and we've now got the county and the school system all working together to try to provide these, these opportunities for our, our young people. And uh, this would not work if we didn't have the businesses to be supportive of it. Uh, while the city does this part, the county does this part, the school system does this part, uh, what's important is that we really get the business community involved. I, I believe it's an excellent opportunity for young people to really get engaged in, in the world of work before they actually have to start working. And we try to provide opportunities where it's a win-win situation for the young people as well as the companies that provide them opportunities. Uh, so tonight, uh, we have an opportunity to recognize some of those persons. I, I can tell you that uh, it's an overwhelming uh, request that we get from young people. We, we've had probably over 1,600 young people who sign up uh, for an opportunity to uh, work during, during the summer. And by the way, this is, has become into a sort of a year-round program also. Uh, unfortunately, we, we just don't have the number of jobs uh, that we like to have to provide employment for all the young people that apply. So this year we had over 400 and six day persons that, that were provided opportunities. And tonight we'd like to recognize uh, some of them as well as more importantly, we also want to recognize the companies that have been involved. I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem and again, Councilman Steve Shule if you would join me uh, in the circle here as, as I call the names of the companies that uh, we're recognizing tonight. And as I call your name, if you would come up and We'd like you to go down to that area. If you don't mind. Yeah. And I, I really should be giving you guys the scripture to understand what's happening. Uh, Ms. Kelly Sizemore representing Kimberly Horn. Is she present? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, Theresa Stocking, representing the Durham Bulls Baseball Club. Uh, Tommy McNeil, representing Gail's Hair Salon. 
If, if, you, if you all wouldn't mind standing up because we want to do a group uh, photo when it's over. Is Tommy out? No, Tommy. Tommy McNeil. Okay. Um, Marilyn Cash representing MS Designs. Kara Taff representing Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. So much. Janice Clark representing Measurement Inc., member of the Durham Workforce, Workforce Development Board also. Okay. Uh, Angela Lee representing Hayti Heritage Center. Is Angela present? Mary Ann Black representing Duke University Health System. I didn't see Mary Ann here. Okay. Uh, Kanisha Dickens representing Spring Valley Living Home Care. Robert DeRoe representing AT&T of North Carolina. I know AT&T has participated very heavily. And Leslie Simons representing Seeds. Jennifer Jordan, representing McKibbe and Jordan, PA law firm. Megan Risley, representing Dress for Success, a member of the Durham Workforce Development Board also. <coughs> and Maria Bird, representing NCCU, North Carolina Central University. Thank you. If we could all give these businesses a round of applause, please. That's fine, thank you. Our next recognition uh, recognizes the National Arts and Humanities Month, and I'm going to ask Sherry DeVries. Is, she, is Sherry? Okay, great. And why Sherry's coming forth, I, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to participate in Cinefest this past week, week weekend before last. Uh, Dan Ellison is president of DAC and uh, Carrie Knowles a Piedmont Laurette was going to make some brief remarks. But I, 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 I know we're here for the National Arts and Humanities piece, but I, I can't help but congratulate Durham Arts Center and Sherry for the Cinefest. I, I've had an opportunity, as I told her, to probably attend, at least be around for most of the times that Cinefest has been in existence. And this past weekend, not this past weekend, the weekend before last when they had it, uh, to me, in my opinion, was the best Centerfest that, that I've been able to participate in. And I, I've only, I was only there for a Saturday, but when you looked at the weather, the vendors, the entertainment, uh, the way it was laid out, the food, 
the really family-friendly type environment that, that existed. Uh, it had to make all of us proud, and I just want to congratulate you again for doing such a super job. And I know you didn't do it by yourself. I know you had a bunch of volunteers and et cetera that went along with it. But the fact is it was under your leadership that it took place, and uh, you'd be congratulated for it again. Uh, the proclamation reads, whereas the arts and humanities enhance and enrich the lives of all Americans, whereas the arts and humanities affect every aspect of life in America today, including the economy, social problem solving, job creation, education, creativity, and community livability, and whereas cities and states through their local and state art agencies and representing thousands of cultural organizations have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanities Month for several years, whereas the US, United States Conference of Mayors has actively participated in National Arts and Humanities Month since 1984, whereas the United States Conference of Mayors National Arts Partner Americans for the Arts will again coordinate this year a national awareness campaign of activities for National Arts and Humanities Month, whereas the nation's 100,000 nonprofit arts organization, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the nation's 5,000 local art agencies, the Arts and Humanities Council of the 50 states and the six U.S. jurisdictions, and the President of the United States have participated in the past and will be asked to participate again this year in this national celebration Whereas the United States Conference of Mayors urges mayors to build partnerships with their local arts agencies and other members of the arts and humanities communities in their cities. Now, therefore, William V. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do their proper claim October 2014 as National Arts and Humanities Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and witness my hand in the Corporate City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the sixth day of October 2014. I'm going to present this to the chair of the DAC, and I'm going to ask Ms. Carrie Knowles, uh, Piedmont Laureate, and she will make a few brief remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to serve as the 2014 Piedmont Laureate. As Laureate, I've placed writing workshops in historic sites, libraries, museums, vineyards, senior citizens, and senior citizens communities. I've been humbled by the courage people have shown in telling their own stories and have been inspired by those who have left the workshops, written more, and gathered friends together to form their own writing groups. I feel like the Laureate program and I have worked well together this year to create a network of new writers. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you for making this program possible. I'm just going to speak for a few moments. Just wanted to Thank you for this proclamation, and thank you all for taking part in this proclamation. And if you think back to when you were all just little kids on your parents' knees or grandparents' knees, the things that you'll remember are maybe poems that they read to you, songs that you sang together, stories, um, all of that storytelling, all of that poetry, all of the drawings on the kitchen, uh, kitchen table, the things stuck up on, with magnets on refrigerators. I mean, all that is the arts and humanities and, and sort of the beginnings of how we all come into the world and see the world and, it's, um, and it permeates our lives, every part of it. And so it's great to have a month that recognize it, it recognizes it especially, but every day of the year, really, we're all filled with artwork and communication, and the way that we all interact is part of the arts and humanities. Just one reminder that um, Mary Siemens, who sat, up, who sat up there at one point in the past, and her husband, James Siemens, were instrumental in actually behind the scenes in creating the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities back in the mid-60s, and so there's a real direct connection to the national level of the arts and humanities that we have here in Durham, and, and we should remember all of that, because the history is also part of the humanities. So thank you all, thank you, Mayor, thank you. And we just want to congratulate Carrie Knowles, our 2014 Piedmont Laureate, and we have just distributed copies of her recent book, Ashoan's rug for you to enjoy. 
And for everyone in Durham, we encourage you to enjoy the arts, participate in the arts, and celebrate National Arts and Humanities Month. And thank you all so very much. Another program that the U.S. Conference of Mayors has been very involved in is a program called Dollar Wise Campaign. And it's a program which really works to provide financial literacy for uh, persons in cities of where mayors are. And we also focus very heavily on trying to get our young people involved. Uh, this year we have a young person who participated and this is the second time in a row that uh, one of our young people have been recognized. And I'm going to ask Ms. Kyla Ponciana and her mother if they would join me, please. The Dollar Wise campaign, as I indicated, really is an opportunity to provide uh, financial literacy for uh, any person, but more importantly, we work on it with our young people to do that. And as I said, uh, persons are recognized, and this year, this is the second year in a row that someone from Durham has been won a prize through the Durham Youth Work Internship Program. And tonight, uh, I'm going to present Kyla with this, it's called an iPod Shuffle. An iPod Shuffle, I'm sure everybody on my council understands what an iPod Shuffle is. But in any event, it's, it's something that uh, merits uh, your, your, the work that you've done, and we want to appreciate for what you do and continue to get involved in programs such as this. She uh, worked during her internship program at the NCCU Business and Auxiliary Services Department, and she's also a student at Kestrel Heights. So, Kyla, we want to present this with you and say congratulations, and if you have any comments you want to make, feel free to do that by your mother. Well, I, <clears throat> I appreciate this honor for being a part of the Dollar Wise and for letting me be a part of the program as well. I enjoy helping people and I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem uh, if you would join me. And Ms. Ariella Sands Bell, the Executive Director for the Durham Crisis Response Center, and her board members, Janice Humphreys and Shannon McCabe, if they would also, and any, anyone else that you'd like to bring up. <laughs> I see a lot of familiar faces here. This recognition uh, really focuses on Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I know we've had uh, so much over the last couple of months that have been related to uh, domestic violence. And, but I, I will say here in Durham, I think we've been sort of in the forefront of trying to, to deal with this issue here in, in Durham, and it's uh, no small part of the fact that uh, Arella Bell Science has, Sam Bell, I don't know why I want to call you Bell. <laughs> Uh, has been the executive director and leading this effort. So I'm going to turn it over to the Mayor Pro Tem if she would uh, present the proclamation. Read if you don't mind. And the proclamation reads, whereas home should be a place of warmth, unconditional love, tranquility, and security, and for most of us, home and family can indeed be counted among our greatest blessings. Tragically, for many, these assumed blessings are tainted by violence, fear, and abuse. And whereas domestic violence is more than a family disagreement, it is willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, emotional and financial abuse, 
torture of persons and pets, and other abusive behaviors. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in every four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime, and an estimated 1.3 million women are victims of physical assault by an intimate partner each year. And whereas women are not the only targets, young children and the elderly are also among those who are emotionally and physically scarred by violence. We believe and support the notion that everyone, regardless of gender, identification, ethnicity, age, or other credence, deserves a safe home. And whereas we strongly support the collaborative efforts of organizations and systems that confront this crisis, law enforcement officials, the criminal justice system, victim advocates, health care providers, clergy, and other concerned citizens are working together to end domestic violence. We recognize their compassion and dedication to ending this epidemic and applaud their efforts. And whereas in 2013, Durham Crisis Res Response Center provided emergency shelter to over 279 women and children fleeing domestic violence, but turned away 100 for lack of space. DCRC also answered over 3,000 calls on the 24-hour English and Spanish crisis lines, in addition to providing crisis intervention, counseling, court advocacy, and other services to over 1,100 victim survivors. And whereas seven persons have been killed in domestic violence-related homicides from 2013 to date, in Durham County. Therefore, we remain committed to outreach, public awareness, and education as essential elements in changing the culture of violence in our community. It is imperative that local government, health professionals, law enforcement, faith communities, educators, and civic organizations speak out about domestic violence, especially for our children in order to end the cycle of violence so that all may experience a safe life that is free of violence. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the great city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim, I added great, uh, October 2014 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to observe this month by becoming aware of the tragedy of domestic violence and supporting those working and participating in community efforts. Aurelia, I will give you this. Who do you want? Who's your board chair? Oh, be good. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you very much for uh, acknowledging this month. And on behalf of uh, the board, I want to thank the council persons and the mayor and the city of the Durham for uh, acknowledging this and just. You know, just a side note that this is, like she said, the children, if you want to reduce crime in this community, you really need to pay attention and not turn a deaf ear to domestic violence because that continues to breed the children in the home. So thank you very much for this on behalf of the board members and the staff at DCRC. One thing I'd like to make note of, we gave you some cards and some ribbons. This summer, with the things that we heard in the media about the NFL. It posed an opportunity for everyone to talk about violence against women and children. The white ribbon represents men in the movement. We will not end domestic or sexual violence in our community, in our country, until men step up and step out. And so as you wear your white ribbon this month, I hope you have the conversation with folks who ask you what that ribbon means so that you can talk to them and say that I am a man who stands against the violence against women. And of course, the purple ribbon is our standard ribbon for women and for uh, representing domestic violence. Thank you so much again on the behalf of the board of directors and our staff and volunteers. Thank you for all you do.
I'd like to recognize members of the council for any comments that you may have, announcements. Recognize Councilman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to ask Larry Jarvis to come up to the microphone for a moment. So um, I've just recently understood that Larry will be leaving us for a job in Raleigh, and I wanted to thank you for all your years of service and dedication. We have really, I, it's been an honor for me to be able to work with you. I wish you all the best, so thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Thank you. It's been an honor to have had the opportunity to be of service to the city of Durham. Uh, I think we have accomplished a lot in the 10 years that uh, I have been here. And um, as I told the city manager when I notified him, I'm right down the street and I'm hoping to be invited back next spring when we have the open house for the lofts that's outside. Any other comments, announcements? Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just did not want to let today go by without recognizing the red letter nature of today. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court um, declined to hear appeals uh, to um, federal rulings for in favor of uh, marriage equality. And in Durham, as a city of tolerance and equality and respect for all uh, certainly uh, needs to be at the forefront of applauding uh, that decision that will bring about the possibility for people to marry the people that they love uh, here in Durham and in throughout North Carolina. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to be excused in exactly four minutes. So. Five minutes. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Any other announcements? If not, recognize the city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items this evening. Well, likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And uh, likewise, city clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, I'd like to inform you that a supplemental item has been added to the agenda this evening. It's entitled Durham Chapel Hill Car Board Barrel MPO Board Appointments. It was on for Thursday, Mr. Shaw, but Mr. Mayor wanted it on tonight. I uh, entertain a motion on this. So it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I had uh, asked Councilman Shule, I, I, I personally serve as the uh, member for the Durham Chapel Hill uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, and Steve served as, as the alternate. Uh, I have uh, been elected to serve as chairman of the Triangle Transit Authority. And I just felt that I, I need to give up something, and uh, it's very important, uh, this position, MPO. So what I've asked Steve, if he would consider becoming the member, and I would become the alternate to the MPO, and that's basically the nature of the supplemental item. Um, we'll go through the consent agenda items. Uh, consent agenda items may be approved by single motion if a council member or person from the audience chooses to have an item pulled, uh, we do that and recognize it at the appropriate time. Uh, I'll just read the heading. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is workforce development board appointment. Item three is code enforcement performance order for June 2014. Item 14 are guidelines for dedicated funding source for funded small project development and neighborhood revitalization. I'll pull that item. Okay. Uh, item five is water residuals and wastewater biosolids, dewatering, hauling, disposal, land application, and associated services, service contract award to Senegro Central LLC. Item six is demolition of water management structures, contract awarded to distribution uh, LLC. Item seven is the bid report for August 2014. 
Item 8 is renewal of stop loss contract with Reliance Standard Life Insurance Company for the 2014-2015 benefit year. Item 9 is the Third Amendment to Workforce Investment Act contract between the City of Durham and Educational Data Systems Incorporated. Item 10 is utility extension agreement with Thomas M. Eeks and Cheryl F. Eeks to serve 3629 Freeman Road, and that's sewer only. Items 11 through 13 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearing items. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the exception of item four. Second. It's been properly moved by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Councilman Brown. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we we'll move to the general business agenda for public hearings. Item 11 is street closings, Amanda Road, street closing 14 Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. The item before council this evening is a request by Tony Tate of Tony M. Tate Landscape Architecture, PA, who proposes to close approximately six, uh, excuse me, 870 linear feet of Amanda Road, which is the entire length of this street. The right-of-way is currently open and is improved. If the request is approved, the right-of-way will be recombined with the adjacent properties. The request has been reviewed by applicable city and county agencies as well as outside service providers, and no negative effects have been identified. Staff is recommending approval of this item, and I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Uh, you've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing item. I would ask, the public hearing is open. I'd ask first other questions by members of the council and the staff report. Uh, hearing none, I would ask, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item, this item being a public hearing item? Do, do you want to speak on the signing? Okay. Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. I would encourage the public hearing to be closed. My respect for the council. Entertain a motion on item. Second. It's been properly moved. Second, second, moved by Councilwoman Katadi. Second by Councilwoman Brown. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moved item 12, zoning map change, Hanover Point subdivision C, Z14-00004. Good evening, Steve Madeline again with the Durham City County Planning Department. I'd first like to certify for the council that proper notification has been carried out in accordance with both state and unified development ordinance standards and that affidavits are part of the case file. Zoning case Z14-04, Hanover Point subarea C is a request by Lennar Carolina's LLC for a zoning map change from its current zoning designation of plan density, or excuse me, plan development residential 4.76 uh, to a plan density, excuse me, plan development residential 4.0 for a 13.96 acre track located at 1030 McLam uh, Drive, which is located east of Mineral Springs Road in eastern Durham. This request, if approved, also removes existing committed elements applied to this property through zoning case Z0604, which was the Hanover Point, originally Ellington Place property, uh, originally approved by City Council on October 2nd of 19, or excuse me, 2006. I apologize, I'm having a hard time reading this evening. Uh, the property in this case represents approximately 13.96 acres of the larger 63-acre Hanover Point project if approved, this request would reduce the number of housing units allowed on the site from 68 to 41, and in essence, a 27 unit reduction. The applicant has committed that all housing units on the site will be single family uh, units. Uh, because of the adjacent bright leaf at the park uh, development, uh, the, um, uh, excuse me, uh, development is not being developed at its originally <laughs> anticipated density. Several transportation improvements associated with the 2006 zoning approval for this property are not currently warranted based on determination by NCDOT and the City Transportation Department, including the installation of additional westbound and eastbound through lanes on Sharon Road and a traffic signal at the intersection of Sharon Road and Ashton Glen. Staff has determined that the request is consistent with the uh, conference of plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. The Planning Commission has rec recommended approval of this request at their August 12, 2014 meeting by a vote of 12 to 0. I'd be happy to answer any questions the Council has. Again, this is a public hearing item. Uh, public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Um, I only have two persons that have signed up to speak for this item, uh, so I want to make sure that uh, if someone else wants to speak, they have an opportunity before I sign the time to this. Is anyone else that wants to speak on this item that has not signed up? Uh, if not, then uh, we will allow 10 minutes each for the 
proponent and 10 minutes for the op opponents. And before the speaker identifies himself, I want to make sure that the council members have any questions you want to ask on this. If not, if you would just state your name and address, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bell and Mayors of City Council. My name is Robert Schunk, located at 2627 University Drive here in Durham. Uh, I'm here representing Lennar Homes for this project. And uh, a few things to point out for this is we're essentially trying to keep the, uh, we're proposing the same projects as we proposed before. And I'll point out a couple of clarifications. Um, as Mr. Medlin uh, alluded to, uh, the purpose to come tonight before you all was to remove a committed element for proposed road improvements at the intersection of um, Ashton and Glen Road and Sharon Road. The reason they were previously required before was there is an entrance to the Brightleaf community that is no longer being constructed and that is this in intersection right here. Um, we're maintaining the four units of uh, density. This proposal reduces traffic generation by tw 271 trips, reduces the student demand. Um, I'm also here to say that we will uh, recommit to the $500 per unit donation to the Durham, Pool, uh, Durham Public Schools and also will exclude the zero lot lines as was committed previously per the language uh, written in the pre prior zoning approval. Um, this was the entrance, uh, this is currently the entrance, the entrance to Brightleaf was moved down to this area here. This is the site in question. This here is the prior development plan, and you'll see that we are making a connection to Ashton Hall that was rezoned in 2005. Hanover Point, you see here, was approved in, uh, by City Council in 2006, showing uh, this connection north to McLam Road, this proposed stub road. Tree coverage was proposed in this area, as well as this area around the stream buffer. And then this is our proposed development plan, showing the three connections showing the tree coverage in this area as well, and again over here. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions by proponent, by members of the council? If not, uh, call on Greg Stocking. Is that correct? You have 10 minutes. Could you reset the clock then, please? Hopefully I won't need that much. <laughs> uh, my name is Greg Stocking. I'm a resident of McLam Drive, uh, 1014 McLam, um, just a couple doors down from where the um, connection between the uh, uh, new uh, road, Willowcrest Road, will connect into McLam Drive. Um, my contention is that the roads um, in our um, subdivision, our community, um, and I want to go through a little presentation here that you have taken some pictures and things. Come on, mouse. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's all right. Sorry about that. All right. I'll just start it. Okay, F5. There we go. Thank you. So the, um, what we're here for, I, um, we have some representatives from other um, families within the community, um, within our, within our, our community, um, that are gonna be affected by all the traffic that is going to get, uh, come down our road due to this connection that's gonna happen between Willowcrest Road and uh, McLam Drive. Um, so what I would like to show you is, um, so the homeowners, um, I went and talked to, a vast majority of the ones that would be directly affected by this, which is uh, on McLam Drive, part of Bristolwood Drive, and then Danbury, which is the connecting roads that would allow people to cut through our neighborhood to get to um, Holder Road. And uh, basically, I would like the, the City Council to reconsider their um, the current uh, plans, which are to make that connection um, and, and follow that through. Um, I have a petition signed from 32 of the homeowners in our little subdivision area. Um, that are against it um, just due to the high amount of traffic uh, some of the reasons a lot of them bought houses in this little area is that it is a dead-end road there is no outlet other than the one on uh, Holder Road and so they liked that sort of isolation um, it's also much larger lots than uh, what is in Hanover Point we're on anywhere from uh, half an acre to an acre plus lots 
Um, so it's quite a different sort of uh, community. You know, all the trees weren't knocked down to build the, the houses and things like that. The, the subdivision or the, uh, the community was started um, 40 years ago, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. And uh, so our, it was, our community was started over 40 years ago. Um, the original road was all gravel. Um, roads, I should say, there's multiple roads here. Um, the road was paved in 1984 um, after the state collected an assessment by all the current homeowners based on the linear footage of their, uh, their, their footage or frontage on the road. Um, and it really wasn't paved as you would think paving of as in asphalt paving. It was more of a gravel tar kind of paving. Um, so the road, honestly, and you'll see some pictures of it, is not going to be able to handle the amount of traffic uh, that I believe would come down through that uh, cut through um, coming out of this, new, this Hanover Point subdivision area. Um, it was patched about four years ago. I've got some pictures of that too. And again, it was a, you know, a, a, a mild attempt at best to patch some of the bigger holes in the road. Um, a term that uh, I, I sort of thought about when I look at the road is threadbare. Um, it is that worn and it's in that bad a shape. Um, I, I, I even went to the DOT and talked to a gentleman there and he went on you know, uh, Google Earth and said, yeah, it is, it is in pretty bad shape. Um, so if this, you know, if this connection goes through, our road's going to get even worse much faster and it's going to end up being on a state to have to repair it because as I understand it, there are no contingencies or any uh, things on the uh, original approval of this that there are going to be any improvements done to our road if this gets connected. Um, as I understand it, there are none. Um, so anyhow, there's lots of areas with little to no, uh, uh, or a lot of gravel and, and very little tar to hold it all together. And I've got some slides to show you. Um, I'll kind of try to describe each one of them as we go through them. This is a picture of the end of McLam Drive. You can see the zoning uh, sign there as it goes through the woods um, with the um, other street uh, called Willow Crest being on the other side of those woods. Uh, and that's the lot you're looking at that's in this uh, uh, rezoning contention. Anyhow, this is a picture turn around and heading down McLam Drive, um, heading to uh, Mc, um, Thistlewood. Um, I'm just up there on the left, just past those first set of trees. Um, as you can kind of look at the slides uh, down in the bottom there, you can already see that you can see some of the road uh, up close, but I've got some other really good ones. Here's a picture. I mean, and I could take lots. <laughs> Um, these are just uh, a random sampling of pictures of the road as it exists uh, as of Sunday afternoon. It's a beautiful day to go out and take pictures. Um, as you can see, there's lots of places where it's pure gravel, um, not uh, ash, you know, very little to no asphalt. Um, cracked, it's, it is not like what I said, uh, considered what would be an asphalt road or a, a paved road. Um, in a lot of places, it's literally down to dirt like that shot right there. Um, this is another just sort of uh, a larger picture of the road going down McLam Drive, heading away from the proposed uh, uh, zoning change area. This is the first intersection that you come to, which is McLam Drive. If you keep going straight down McLam Drive, that turns into gravel right past this intersection. It goes down into a uh, low area where it dead ends. Um, and if you look at a map, it kind of looks like there's another road called Rikon that connects to McLam. It doesn't. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a water easement or a, a runoff type area down there. It's a low area that uh, you can't, they won't build the road across. So it's it basically dead end. So all the traffic is going to come down McLam Drive, turn here onto Bristol Wood. Um, this intersection is tight, to say the least. Um, if someone is coming down McLam, turning on to Bristol Wood, they have to wait unless they have a very small car, they have to wait on McLam to let the car come off of Bristol Wood first to make the turn. Um, I've run, run into it a few times in my nine years there, but it, it, it does cause a problem. That, that intersection is not gonna handle a lot of traffic going in both directions very well. Um, there is a stop sign, there's no stop sign there on McLam, but there is one sort of in the trees there that you can see on uh, Bristol Wood. Going around the corner, this is a picture coming, looking back towards Bristol Wood. Um, with the McLam turning off to the left there and to the right, but that's gravel. Um, this is a picture going up Bristol Wood, and as you can see, people, you know, when they have driveways, but when people come to visit, like on this Sunday, they're watching football games, you get a lot of traffic, um, you're going to have problems if, you know, two people come to that area at the same time. The road's just not wide enough, and I'll address that here in a few minutes. Um, here's a picture looking back from that same road at the top, right before you would turn on to... Um, Danbury. 
Here's a picture of the intersection at Danbury. It is a little bigger intersection, and Danbury is off to the left, off to the top there, and that would take you directly out to Holder Road. And this is a picture looking back up towards uh, Bristolwood. And as you can see in each of these pictures, I didn't take a lot more pictures of the close-ups of the road, but the road is not in good shape um, to handle this kind of, the amount of traffic. And I'll, again, I, I've got some numbers to show that too. So this is going down the road. Here's another picture looking back up. Um, as you can see there, there's already some fairly large holes. This is right before you. You can see the stop sign up in the top. That is uh, Holder Road and Danbury. This is the picture of Holder Road and Danbury. And there's a, a, co a comparison of this intersection to one just down the road, which is where the current connection through a, a road called High, How or High Fox um, and uh, I got the other names, but uh, it, it connects to Broach Road, and that's the way they get out to Holder Road now. Um, so there already is a connection to get from the subdivision out to Holder Road. Um, and the, but the intersection there is much larger. Broach Road is much larger, and I can go. Th I actually went out and measured, and I'll show you that. But this is a picture of again uh, McLam and uh, uh, Holder Road. Here's another picture looking at that same intersection. All right, this is a picture of this is Broach approaching um, Holder, and you can see that's a much larger intersection. This is a picture of the entrance of the current subdivision onto um, High Fox Road. As you can see, there's curbs, and it is a much, much wider road and obviously better paved. This is a picture of where that road connects into High Fox, which ultimately turns into Broach. So I went out and measured. McLam Drive is 18 feet wide, Bristolwood is 18 feet wide, Danbury is 20 feet wide, Broach is 22 feet wide, Pennock, which is the connector road, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but it connects Broach to um, High Fox, um, is 20 feet, and Hanover Point, the roads with the, with the curbs, is 27 feet wide. Um, that's 22 feet wide with a two and a half inch paved sort of gutter curb sloped area on both sides of the road. Um, McLam and part of Bristolwood have a total of 14 houses on it. So obviously it's nowhere near as highly populated as the other uh, subdivision. Lots are again half an acre to an acre plus. Traffic on I actually got up and uh, sat on that connector road, that area I took a picture of that connects the new subdivision with um, Broach and Pennock and all that. And from 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m., 38 cars went across that, that intersection, just that connector road that used that that we're using the connection between Holder Road and the new subdivision. 38 in an hour and a half. Um, multiply that out, that's a whole lot of traffic. And our road um, actually, whoops, oh, I ran, how'd I do that? Sorry about that. Our road is actually only a quarter of a mile and the connection now is half a mile. So no curbs, we don't have any sidewalks. They have sidewalks in the new division. Um, we're only one block over from where that High Fox connection is there's literally houses back to back and then there's this new connection, McLam Road. I just really don't think it should be built. Um, there's Delmar Road, Tanner's Mill Drive, Glenview Lane, there's all these other connectors that look like they could have been built that weren't. And finally, um, the existing roads were just never designed to handle this kind of traffic. The conditions of the roads are, are, are bad already. Size of the roads, um, intersections, side, no sidewalks. I would propose they've already got a stub road designed to an open area that's just the other side of McLam that's further away from the current connector road. Um, I would propose that it runs actually behind Rikon and McLam properties. I would propose you wait and they would use that and as part of that development it would become a connector road directly into Holder Road straight shot and they could build the road that could handle this kind of traffic. And I believe that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Sure. Let me ask are there questions or comments by members of the council on this item? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. I don't have a Okay, so uh, I guess first of all, I'll ask, I, I want to talk about this. I've been looking at maps. Everything south of here is City Road. Everything to the north is DOT. I'm assuming that, um, so I kind of want to get the staff's assessment of the roads to the south, you know, sufficient, adequate. I'd love to get an idea of how many vehicles use these roads already and 
like what percentage increase in the load we're talking about here, whether we're talking about a 50% increase or a 2% increase. And, and I'll ask the applicants if they have any response to what's been said. Um, Bill Judge with uh, City Department of Transportation. The, uh, on general average, you can expect about uh, 10 trips per day for a single family house. So the roads to the south are primarily serving the Ashton Hall development which is a little over 300 units. So there's probably about 3,000 trips spread out among all those roads. Um, so if the road has 20 houses on it, it may have 200 trips a day. Um, the, I think the roads to the north are, are all county roads. None of that area has been annexed. I believe the uh, citizen indicated that there was about 41 homes in that area. So they prop those roads probably have an average of about 400 trips spread throughout that area. And the condition of the roads to the south, we were seeing a lot of pictures, yeah. lots of pictures going by. The, the roads to the south were all built to city standards um, fairly recently with the Ashton Hall development within the last 10 years. So those all meet current city standards and the, the roads to the north are all, as he indicated, maintained by DOT. And, Thank you. Applicants, you have any, anything you want to say? I concur with the statements the bill made. Um, you know, we do sympathize with the neighbors. Unfortunately, the, the ordinance doesn't allow us to not make the connection. Um, you know, we were required to make the connection in 2006, and we're uh, remaining to be consistent with that. Council Brown, you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on August 12th of this year, the, uh, the Planning Commission voted uh, approval for this project uh, by 12 to 0 vote. Uh, was the road condition discussed at that meeting? Steve Medlin with the Planning Department. Uh, Council Member Brown, yes, it was discussed at the Planning Commission meeting. Okay. And I'm a little confused. The roads, the major roads that you were talking about are state roads. You note um, sometimes. Yes, they're, they're state roads. Oh, uh, yeah. Sometimes I do not say state maintained roads yes, yes they're state maintained roads i just say state <laughs> roads because Correct. too often they're not maintained um and we did come talk to the um, planning commission um, i didn't have the presentation at that time uh, prepared just because i didn't know what to prepare um, so we did not have pictures or anything it was all just verbal um, s expressing our concern that the road would not be able to handle the uh, the amount of traffic um, I would think then, from a, a common sense point of view, the, the question would go back to the developers. That is to say, if these roads are as in bad a condition as some of your slides uh, demonstrate, um, how, how are you going to be able to sell the the houses would that be would not not and I'm speaking also uh, as a real estate broker for since 1980 in term would not that not be a detriment to the sale of future sale of these houses uh, George Stanziel with Stewart 115 Cofield Circle in Durham um, no, I, I mean, the, the majority of the, the, the traffic that is generated by our development is really coming from the south. There's really not a lot of reason for them to go north. We don't need this road. We are required to connect, to make these connections by UDO. Um, so, you know, when we design the subdivision, we're going to have to design it to have a road that connects 
uh, to, the, to the points that Robert showed you just a minute ago. Um, and they'll have to be built to city standards. So uh, what you're telling us then, this will not necessarily be a major thoroughfare into no. your development? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Did the applicant have any more that you wanted to add to your, your presentation? The staff, any more comments? Uh, if there aren't any further comments, I'm going to declare the public hearing to be closed and matters back for the council for consideration. Um, Councilman Mark. Um, I, I want to empathize with the uh, people from the community who are concerned about the impacts. I'm studying aerial photos over here and looking at it, and um, I, I believe that if, if cars were to go to the north, I think that you have, I, I, I can really see how that would be an impact on the roads over there. The roads to the south are built, at, from what I can see from aerial photos, built to city standards, and I imagine that um, most everybody who's who purchases a home and among these 40 some odd homes will be using the roads to the south simply because of the, the shape and condition of them. Um, that said, I just want to say I empathize very much, and, um, but I will be supporting this project tonight. Are there other comments, questions on this item? Uh, recognize. Could I respond to one of the comments made about the traffic? Sure, and then I'm going to recognize the staff person. I did, like I said, I did get up at 6.30 one morning Tuesday and sit there for an hour and a half and there were 38 cars that went across that, the current connection that's one block over from where McLam Drive will connect to this new road or to the, the exi their existing road. But the, the connection will go through this new development or this new zoned area that you're doing. It's one block over, 38 cars went across there in an hour and a half. So it, when it, I mean, we got 14 people on McLam Drive going around the corner all the way up to, to Danbury, 14 people. We, you can't, 14 houses. You, you wouldn't generate 38 cars in those 14 houses, let alone, you know, they're going to put another 40 houses, I think, was the number um, in this new development area, which will, the, the closest road that will connect them to anything large quickly is going to be McLam to Thistlewood to Danbury. So I, I respectfully disagree that I think there will be a large amount of traffic going down this road. It's a shorter connection than the one that exists one block over. It's more direct. I got a feeling they're going to use it. And again, the road, until the road gets so bad, they don't want to use it, but that, that's going to happen. Um, so I, I, I disagree. I think there is plenty of traffic that's going to be created, and it already does exist, that is using these roads to go north, not just south. Yes, the majority does go south. There's 300 some odd units in that, uh, that development. Obviously, there would have been a lot more traffic on that road had they all gone north. But they obviously, a large majority goes south, but a fair number will go north. Anybody going out to 98, going out to Wake Forest, going out towards Northern Durham, they're gonna go that route. So I just wanna put that out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you want to make a comment, Steve? Um, Steve Madlin with the Planning Department. I did want to remind the council that the applicant in his presentation did make two additional proffers this evening, one of which is to prohibit zero lot line uh, homes, and the second is to provide a $500 per dwelling unit payment to the Durham Public Schools uh, consistent with the original approval from the 2006 zoning case. I, I, you had a comment? I recognize Councilman Stuhl. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Steve, um, can you talk about the UDO requirement that has been referred to? Uh, absolutely. There is a, uh, a number of provisions in the ordinance which basically requires that if there is an existing road network or street network that uh, adjacent properties as they're developing have to tie into that road network, and that's exactly what the applicant has proposed. And to be clear, the right-of-way has already been dedicated for that connection. Uh, the road itself has not been constructed, but the right-of-way has been dedicated under the, the preceding approval. Uh, that is a required element. Obviously, we want to make sure that we're creating a system of streets that are interconnected in such a way that it provides for reasonable uh, access to all properties. Uh, in this case, this is a intervening property between two segments that they are now making the connection both to the south and to the north. 
Steve, the um, position that the council takes on this, if we were not to approve it, what, what does it say for the development? Uh, if council were not to approve this rezoning request this evening, the developer would fall back on the preceding development plan of record, which basically still shows this connection, and that connection, as I've indicated, would already has already been dedicated. They just have not constructed it. The only issue here is the committed elements and the impact it would potentially have on this project in terms of some of the, the street improvements that are associated with the early, uh, other phases of, this, of the development. And I assume the developer is prepared to do that if, if it's not approved? Is that correct? Okay. In, any further discussion on this item? Well, I recognize uh, Councilman <laughs> Brown. Uh, I guess I'm struck by, and we appreciate everyone coming out uh, this evening about this issue, but uh, you articulated on several occasions uh, that your count was 38 cars in over an hour and a half. So maybe a, I'm not doing my math correctly, but that's a little more than 12 cars every half hour. Is it just me, or that doesn't seem to be an inordinate amount of vehicle traffic? Um, so I, briefly please. It's not that the quantity, I mean, it is the quantity of the cars. It's not just it, the, the road that they're going to be traveling on, McLam, Thistlewood, and Danbury. The shape of the road is in such a thing that if you count, there's only 14 houses on McLam and Thistlewood that drive on that part of the road. If you start doubling that, tripling that over the course of, uh, you know, a day, every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, that road, our road, is going to <laughs> disintegrate quickly. Um, for the, the low amount of traffic it gets now, it's falling apart. And it's just going to, you know, again, there's no provisions to do anything about widening it, uh, you know, repaving it. There's nothing. It's just, it's not going to be able to handle this traffic. And so it's not just about literally, I mean, it is sort of related to all the cars, but it's going to tear the road up and it's going to create a lot of traffic that we don't currently have by any stretch of that number. Well, I would suggest and hope that the developers would, would understand your plea, and certainly when it comes to the construction uh, of these houses, that they would direct the uh, construction crews to t take the, the other approach into that area and not use that street. I would also hope that, uh, I know this is, I know this is a wild suggestion, but uh, perhaps going to NCDOT and uh, and requesting that, uh, geez, you know, we've got a, yet another development uh, coming in here that uh, that we need assistance in this road. And present your uh, very well documented uh, presentation. Because we, I actually did go see the DOT. Uh, I, I know you did, but. Uh, maybe in another year or two, once the development is finished, uh, then, and keep in mind too that a former mayor of the city of Durham is now uh, one of the uh, major players at, in CDOT, and that's Nick Tennyson, who's very reasonable. Uh, used to be with the Home Builders Association, and uh, perhaps he may have a, a little more sympathetic ear. Uh, to the pleas of you and your neighbors, uh, particularly after this project is completed. And if it happens, as you suggest, the further deterioration of the road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I recognize Councilman Katardi, then Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to appreciate everyone that's come out, and I do empathize with your concerns. I think what I want to do is just remind people that the current approved zoning is PDR 4.76 with 68 single family units approved with an estimated traf traffic generated of 729.
what they're asking for tonight is actually lowering the PDR to 4.0, which is 41 single family units and a uh, proposed decrease well, in the designation of 271 trips. So this is actually better than what currently can be built. And unfortunately, we do have to comply and do recommend um, connectivity for many reasons, including emergency response. So um, I think my colleague had a comment that is interesting. I just wanted to underscore that, 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 the, that the, what they're requesting is does two things. One, it reduces a requirement to do road improvements off-site. And two, it reduces the number of homes from 68 to 41. I'm underscoring what's already been said. So that if we don't make this approval tonight, they're left with having to make the road improvement and therefore having to build 68 homes to help pay for that road improvement. So you may not want the 41 homes but if you look at the alternative, it, 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 you may, at least from my perspective, it's more palatable to the people already living there. Um, we can't, we're not, the, 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 the issue before us tonight is not to zone it to zero or make it a park. It's 41 homes or leave it at 68 homes. So just underscoring that. Yeah, that's Councilman Shul and Councilman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I thought your presentation was excellent and appreciated seeing that new information. Um, it seems to me that, as my colleague Eugene Brown has said already, that your beef is really with the State Department of Transportation. I will say there's, it seems to me, another potential alternative, which is to do what those of us who are up here do, which is to, we live in the city and we pay city taxes, including we've passed a bond that we finance with our city taxes to pave roads. Uh, and so you could certainly petition for annexation uh, and uh, you would be assured of getting a good road. Um, short of that, um, I think you're, you're I understand, I can, I can really understand why you don't like the fact that your roads are deteriorating and the State Department of Transportation doesn't do anything about it. Uh, but um, that isn't our jurisdiction and uh, I think that it could be our jurisdiction, however, if you petition for annexation and you all would have to make that sort of, that sort of uh, decision. But you could have a good road out there. The city has good roads. And um, so something you might want to give some thought to. Recognize Councilman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess my question is a process question. Um, has there been dialogue between the, petition, the petitioners and people who live there now and the developers? I mean. Uh, the question when, when uh, Council Member Katati mentioned that from her perspective uh, the new the proposal may end up being better for the community was ever that ever discussed with be, between the developers and the and the homeowners the current homeowners yeah, yes we met with them briefly after the Planning Commission meeting um, again, we're just, I, I've never been involved in any of this, so um, it all happened just prior to me buying the house. Um, and it may have been why they sold it, I don't know. But uh, anyhow, um, so, I, you know, this is, if, I, if I'd known back then and could have fought the original zoning, I probably would have tried to do the same thing I'm doing now. Um, but I, and I realize it's already been approved. Um, I'm, and that's why I, I even came up with an alternate plan, which is the other set of or the other area that hasn't been developed but anyhow yes we have had that conversation yes they are going to put in less homes um it's just a matter of and i mean to me it's common sense of you know there's already a one connection one block over they could put another connection another one block in the other direction that's much more direct the road could be built to handle this traffic and it wouldn't be a problem um, so it's just you know delaying that connection for however long. And as far as I understand from the developer, and he can speak for himself, but he told me he would love for it not to go through because he can build more houses um, <laughs> over the part, you know, that's the road. So he, you know, it, it's, it's a win for him. It's just he's following the, the guidelines set forth in the statutes that say they got to connect the, the subdivisions. So Thank that's you. all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any, any further comments? Um, when, I, when I see zoning matters, I always want to look at what's the alternative and that's why I asked the question what is the alternative if we don't approve it and I think it's been, been pretty much discussed what, what that is. 
um, it's unfortunate that it is what it is, but uh, we, we don't have too much of a choice. We can turn it down and you get what I don't think you want. Uh, we approve it and then hopefully um, in the long run, either you come into the city or we find out uh, DOT will provide some, some maintenance for you. If it's no further discussion, I'm gonna call the question. I'm not a credit. I called a question. I don't know who made the motion. I heard the second I hear a motion on it. I'll make the motion. Okay, it's been properly moved by Councilman Shule, seconded by Councilman Brown. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes 6 to 0. Thank you. Let's excuse, move to the. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. Um, with zoning hearings, you actually have to adopt a consistency motion as well. There is a second motion that you need to adopt. Uh, it's just you adopt it. Uh, I'll move that we adopt a consistency motion as stated in the um, staff report. It's been properly moved by Councilman Moffitt, second by Councilman Shule. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. Let's move to the next item, please. FY 2015-2020 consolidated plan it needs a public hearing. Good afternoon, Mayor Bell, members of Council, Larry Jarvis, Department of Community Development. As you know, throughout the year, we are required to have two public hearings prior to submitting our annual action plan. The first one is in the process is the needs hearing when the public gets an opportunity to comment on those needs. And the second, which would be in the spring, is when there are actual uh, funding recommendations associated with the annual action plan and consolidated plan. Uh, Wilmer Conyers, the federal programs coordinator, will introduce uh, tonight's public hearing. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council, Wilmer Conyers, Department of Community Development. The purpose of this public hearing tonight is to receive citizen comments on how community development block grant, home investment partnership program, and emergency solution grant funds can be used over the next five years to address the housing and community development needs in Durham. As a recipient of CDBG, HOME, and ESG, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings prior to the submission of the annual action plan. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has not yet announced the FY 15-16 entitlement allocations and for planning purposes, the city is going to use its current FY 14-15 allocations for CDBG, we expect to receive approximately $1,795,508. In home, we expect to receive $831,909. And with ESG, we expect to receive $147,357. This public hearing was advertised in the Herald Sun, the Carolina Times, Que Pasa newspapers and was also um, advertised via our general listserv. A summary of the comments from the public hearing tonight and any written comments that we received during the development of the five-year consolidated plan and the annual action plan will be included in our, in our plans before submission to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. That concludes your comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask, this is a public hearing matter. Are there comments by members of the council? If not, we have several people that have signed up to speak on this item. Um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven persons to speak. Is there anyone else that uh, would like to speak that has not signed up? So I can set the time for it. If you don't mind, if you could go to the uh, podium and have the clerk fill out the card. I, I'm going to call the persons who have signed up and uh, you each have three minutes. If you 
come to the podium to the right as I call your name. Uh, Daryl Gant. Uh, Devin Brown. Raul Herrera. Dick Hales. Stephen Hopkins. James Chavis. James Varra. There you can come up. And you have three minutes. And if any of you have written comments that you would like to leave for the record, you could leave them with the clerk after you finish. All right, good evening. Thank you, Mayor Bell and members of council. Uh, my name's Darrell Gant. I'm branch manager with Wells Fargo Home Mortgage in Durham, and I'm also board chairman of the Durham Regional Finance Center. Uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Durham Regional Finance Center uh, to raise awareness about the critical need for local government uh, to invest in its citizens regarding affordable home ownership and other wealth building opportunities. Uh, home ownership remains one of the largest and most vital assets for family and community wealth, wealth building. It inspires civic responsibility, community involvement, and helps to ensure financial stability and income for many, uh, for many during their retirement years. Unfortunately, low to moderate income households, uh, and particularly those comprised of minorities, are at extreme disadvantage in achieving and sustaining home ownership. The recent recession hit minority households the hardest, uh, and their recovery for the devastating effects of the recession has been slow. Therefore, it is essential uh, that we restore and support affordable and sustainable home, home ownership options for low and moderate income families. Community investment coupled with financial education aimed at supporting families to stabilize their household economics as well as to grow their net worth would have a positive and lasting uh, effect on them, the community, and future generations. Research has shown uh, that African Americans and Latinos are far more likely than whites to obtain loans with a higher interest rate. Uh, the key to sustainable low-income low ownership is preparing those consumers or homeowners uh, with, with adequate financial management skills as well as to make educated mortgage choices as they secure an affordable mortgage loan. Since most of us never receive money management and financial planning training in school, at least I didn't, right? Uh, it's imperative that we fill uh, that void with financial education. Since 1998, Durham Regional Finance Center has educated and counseled consumers on a myriad of financial topics, including creating a budget, managing household finances, and purchasing a home. With the highly trained staff and over 100 years of experience in the banking industry, Durham Regional Finance Center, Center is fully equipped to educate potential homeowners on the home buying process, affordability, fair housing, and, and alternatives to high cost lending. Uh, we therefore solicit, solicit your support for home buyer education, asset accumulation, and wealth building opportunities to those who need it most, minorities and other low income, minorities and other low and middle income households. Thank you. Uh, Devin Brown, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell and the members of council. My name is Devin Brown. I'm the Director of Business Development for the Durham Regional Financial Center. I wanted to first begin by saying that Glendola Beasley, the Executive Director of the Durham Regional Financial Center, could not make it this evening due to a scheduling conflict, but uh, she did want you to, to know that uh, she definitely wanted to be here this evening. Um, I'm going to be piggybacking on Daryl's points. Uh, to raise awareness about the community needs, my focus specifically being the need for financial education as it relates to community development. Uh, financial education is, is actually a very broad topic that has a, a ripple effect on many aspects of the lives of the individuals within the households uh, of our community. Uh, the CFED recently reported that 35% of Durham County households live in asset poverty, which is different than income poverty. That's an individual's uh, savings and assets that they can actually use to absorb uh, a financial catastrophe such as an unemployment. 
and 26 of those individuals are considered in extreme asset poverty. 57% of Durham County residents have subprime credit scores. 8% of the Durham County borrowers are 90 or more days past due on a payment, and 46% of Durham renters are considered cost burdened. Given this data, it's easy for us to understand how citizens, many of those, find themselves quote unquote financially stressed. And as a means of addressing poverty in one particular section of the city, Mayor Bell himself has brought about uh, to a series of task force to address specific indicators that include housing, finance, health, public safety, education, and jobs. Financial stress is actually the enemy of each one of those educators, each one of those task force. Financial stress has been known to lead to and to contribute to a number of social ills such as crime, unemployment, homelessness, and even physical stress, which can ultimately lead to physical illness. As such, as financial educators and counselors, we must function much like doctors. We have to first educate our clients on topics ranging from basic money management and behavioral economics, to job training and workforce development, to affordable housing and small business development. Then once we've properly educated them, we are then able to medicate or prescribe an action plan that actually uh, will provide access to resources that can work to empower our community and to reduce that financial stress. Finally, Durham Regional Financial Center's core programming is best described by the great Nelson Mandela who once said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. It's our belief that financial education is an equally powerful weapon which we can use to improve and better our communities. I thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Raul Herrera. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the last speaker uh, articulated some facts and figures that I was had not heard before. Can you be sure to leave that with the uh, clerk? Yes, sir. Of court. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very well done. Good evening, Mayor Bell and Council Members. My name is Raul Herrera and I'm branch banker with BBNT and a board member of the Dural Regional Financial Center. And on behalf of the center, I'm here to provide an overview of the present financial needs of a Durham growing Hispanic population. While local Latinos have solid food in the labor force that represent a young segment of the consumers and business developer, there are questions regarding which financial products and services are most appropriate and effective for them. Many Latinos have never had a ba basic a bank account. Lacking experience in this area, Latinos l are less inclined to access banking services at financial institutions. Therefore, introducing to the their banking option will be beneficial to all concerned. Research shows that Latinos have the ability and willingness to save an interest-bearing account, but they often do not. They are also more likely to have a thin credit file or no credit history, which may affect not only their, uh, their access to affordable credit, but also their employment opportunities given the ever-increased role in one's credit status place in the United States. Additionally, a growing number of Latinos have become a victim of predatory and unscrupulous financial operators. Regarding home ownership, data from 2013 Home Mortgage Disclosure Act confirmed that Latinos and other minorities lack access to the conventional mortgage market. Historical people of color and low, uh, of low wealth receive a disproportionate share of foreclosures due to target of mortgage loans with risky features that were not well underwritten. In addition, these borrowers are more likely to receive government-backed loan programs which are costlier than before. Without market competition from the private market, Latinos and others end up paying more for government insurance mortgage given the low housing recovery. It is imperative that all minorities have access to the mortgage in both the public and the private sector. The housing market cannot recover without them. Durham Regional Financial Center has trained bilingual staff to serve the Hispanic resident. We provide comprehensive array of service, including the personal finance seminars and workshop, credit counseling, home buyer edu education, rental counseling, and pre- and post-home ownership counseling. With our extensive experience, we are fully equipped to help those who are faced with a complex set of financial issues and options. 
We therefore request that the city of Durham's consolidate plans include programs that serve and support Latinos. Thank you very much, Ms. May. You're welcome. Uh, next is Dick Hales. <coughs> Dick Hales, 809 Demarius K4 in Durham. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, as well as Mr. Manager, Mr. Attorney, and Madam Clerk. I'm speaking tonight as a representative of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. I would ask coalition members and supporters who are present to please stand. Thank you. The coalition is a group of community organizations dedicated to help provide greatly needed affordable housing and accessible locations in Durham in the coming years. The group believes that further affordable housing needs to be located near planned transit stations and hubs minimizes the combined cost of housing and transportation for lower income citizens. Coalition supported the resolution that the city and county adopted earlier this year that set a goal for Durham that at least 15% of all housing within a half a mile of each transit station be affordable to persons earning less than 60% of the area median income, AMI. We're supporting that adopted goal by recommending that several issues be seriously considered in the development of the city's 2015-2020 consolidated plan. Number one, we recommend that special priority be given to locate any additional new or preserved affordable housing in Durham within these station areas or hubs. Many of the city's current affordable housing efforts underway or planned are already in these locations. This action will also strengthen the city and TTA's efforts to obtain federal FTA funds to build the planned Durham Orange Rail Transit System. Two, in the coming months, we suggest that the city and other public and community organizations specifically examine and reserve underused properties they own near transit stations for affordable housing number of these sites would be needed. Three, we recommend that the city expand affordable housing development efforts by supporting the establishment of an equitable transit-oriented development fund that would try and maximize available public and private funding for affordable housing. Our preliminary estimates show at least 100 additional affordable units per year would be required near stations in order to help meet this goal for, for a number of years. Four, we recommend that the consolidated plan be closely coordinated with the city's station area strategic infrastructure study known as SASE, which is currently underway. Both these efforts are essential and they need to be coordinated. And number five, we recommend that special attention be given to con support continued funds for transit station area housing affordable to those earning less than 30% AMI, particularly housing for veterans, homeless, disabled, elderly, and other extremely low-income persons. Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments this evening and for the opportunity for our group to partner with the city to meet this very important community goal. I pass a copy of the comments to the city clerk and the community development staff. You're welcome. Next is uh, Stephen Hopkins. Steve Hopkins, 654 North Hardy Street, Apartment B. And I'm just here to remind the city council and the mayor of the commitment to Northeast Central uh, around affordable housing. And while all the attention is being paid to new construction, I want to remind you that we have older elderly uh, folks in our neighborhood that can't afford to fix up their houses, you know, uh, even though they, they want to. And there's no remedy for these folks. So in the coming months, please consider programs to help our uh, seniors who are on fixed income uh, become uh, a little bit better off with some weatherization funds uh, and some uh, uh, rehab funds. Thank you. Welcome. James Chavis. Good evening, Mayor and Councilmen and ladies. I come to you to say about the same. You have too many homes that needs in, in each term fixing. 
but they're not getting fixed. And you said you want to revitalize our area, but you will not put staff out there to bring you the right report. I ask each and every one of you, take time with your own money and your own time, like I do, and ride around East Durham, and you can see the poverty of our area that needs to be revitalized by giving people the opportunity to revitalize it. And also, make sure that the owners revitalize their own homes that people have stayed in over 30 years and paid for them, and they still will not fix them up. Thank you. James Warren. Good evening. Uh, Jim Savara, 1114 uh, Woodburn Road. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here to, to talk about this issue. As a faculty member at Arizona State University and a new resident uh, in Durham starting in 2012, I participated in a recent study of sustainability and social equity, including a case study of Durham, uh, conducted by the International City and County Management Association with funding from HUD. The purpose of the research was to learn more about what local governments are doing uh, to promote social equity and how they relate these activities to other sustainability goals. Sustainability means promoting livability and long-term viability for all groups in the community. Most local governments are not actively pursuing social equity as part of the way they approach sustainability. In contrast, Durham City and County are leaders uh, in the wide range of activities they are pursuing. Still, the shortage of affordable housing is a major challenge to Durham in its efforts to be a sustainable community with thriving, livable neighborhoods, a goal that the council has set. Adding light rail greatly expands the opportunity for residents uh, to uh, move around the city and have access to opportunities. Light rail must not, however, be an amenity for the affluent, with low and moderate income persons excluded by the absence of housing uh, in stations throughout the system or displaced by increasing housing costs. They must have the opportunity to live in affordable housing across the full system, and existing affordable housing must be protected. In estimating needs for affordable housing in the consolidated plan, it is important to consider not only the current conditions, but also trends that may be impacting those needs in the future. In particular, development uh, pressures in Durham, uh, the impact on housing values of installing the right light rail system itself, uh, as well as social and economic changes. I encourage the city to consider increasing the scale and pace of housing development in its new consolidated plan. In the 2010 plan, with an estimated 38,000 low and moderate income households facing housing problems, including excessive costs, the five-year goal from 2010 to 2015 was to provide only 230 new units plus 50 housing units designed for homeless persons. The city needs to do more now. At a pace of 100 new units per year, uh, it would be 500 new units over this next five-year period in proximity to transit stations. And it seems like it's very important to keep up with the pace of development rather than having to catch up after market rate housing has been constructed. These are formidable challenges, but Durham has the opportunity of being recognized as a national leader in promoting new housing and preventing displacement. The city's commitment to affordable housing should be supported by creative strategies and partnerships. The goal is to make Durham sustainable, that is a cohesive, vibrant, and welcoming community for all its residents now and in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Ms. Cynthia Harris. Good evening, Mayor Bell and City Council members. I am the Rapid Rehousing Coordinator with Housing for New Hope. Before I go any further, let me introduce you to our new Executive Director, Gretchen Sonata, and she'll just wave. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Rapid Rehousing. Our job is to put homeless households into permanent housing. My pressing issue this evening is there's not enough affordable housing in Durham. 
we, we're um, scheduled to house at least 70 households this year. And right now on my desk is either 20 to 30 referrals for housing um, of homeless families. I have a database of over 50 landlords. And out of those 50, some of them may have two or three properties. We put people in those properties that are not moving out, which does not free up more available housing. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to find housing in Durham. If we do find housing that is affordable, it appears not to be affordable once we put people in there and they add the utilities to it. That means they're paying about half of their income to maintain housing. The numbers of homeless households are increasing. Um, more people that have been staying from house to house are asking for help, and right now, it's difficult finding them a permanent place to stay that they can afford. There's limited temporary housing in Durham, and there's limited permanent housing. Um, we have very few shelters that can take people temporarily, and the ones that can take people can only hold about 20 spaces. So what I'm saying tonight is I'm asking that you consider the proposal and help us to get more permanent affordable housing. I'd like to end by saying thank you for your current funding, including funds for rapid rehousing. Thank you. Uh, last speaker is Ms. Selena Mack. Is there anyone else that will be speaking besides All right, Selena? Um, good evening, Mayor Bell and members of the City Council. My name is Selena Mack. I'm the Executive Director of Durham Community Land Trustees, 1208 West Chapel Hill Street in Durham, North Carolina. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your support of affordable housing um, in Durham and certainly to those of us who provide it. Um, but despite all of our efforts, uh, the need for affordable housing has never been greater. And you've heard um, people talk about that tonight. Um, and the need will continue to grow, particularly as we um, approach the, the, the idea of bringing transit to Durham. Um, so one of the things that concerns me and I want to just kind of um, bring to your attention and to hopefully the, um, other, the attention of the other departments is that as we consider the need for um, affordable housing over the next five years, my, my biggest concern is a term of affordability. And um, so to the best of my knowledge, the the, we're current, for the use of these federal funds, the term of affordability is 15 to 20 years. And I, I certainly could be on, but that's the, the maximum term of, of, um, of mandated affordability on these units that we're developing, that we're targeting federal funds for is 15 to 20 years. So essentially what that means, if, if you've developed affordable housing today using home dollars, by the time transit got in place, there would be no mandate for those houses to remain affordable. Um, so what I'm, my concern is, and you know, certainly one of the things that I'm, um, want to um, require a request is that the, the city look at the term of affordability. Now I know that in long term and LIHTC, LIHTC properties, um, low income housing tax credit properties, there is the use of an extended use agreement that will extend those uh, years of affordability beyond the, the initial 15 years of affordability. I have no idea what the legality aspects of this is, but I think that it's something as we with, with the limitations on the amount of affordable housing that's, a, I mean, amount of federal funds on other funds that are available for the development of affordable housing, that we really need to start looking at how long we mandate this affordability. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other persons that want to speak on this item? Again, this is a public hearing matter. Uh, let the record reflect that no one else has to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing and going to bring this matter back before the uh, council. Let, let me just make one comment. I guess this is a, an advertisement to a certain extent. Uh, most of the discussions this evening have, have focused on, on affordable housing uh, in our community. We've heard comments about what's happening in Northeast Central Durham. Of course, the issue is not confined to Northeast Central Durham. You focus around the light rail, and uh, we, we've heard you. Uh, you also know that we have a a project program uh, that's looking at the whole issue of reducing poverty uh, neighborhood by neighborhood year by year starting in 2014 and we've selected one of the neighborhoods that we're looking at. Uh, I would invite you, uh, we're about to wrap up the community survey, I think October 24th is going to be the end of that. At that point in time we'll be coming back to the various task force to try to 
begin to look at what we've got and then hopefully develop some strategies and, go and goals for addressing each one of those task force. Housing is one of the task force. Uh, I, I would invite you to share your comments, your thoughts with uh, that particular task force in particular. Uh, Councilman Davis is one of the co-chairs, uh, co uh, Mayor Pro Tem is another co-chair. But uh, I, I realize your task is much bigger than this, but we have an immediate issue that we're beginning to work with where we could use the, the advice, the experience, and your thoughts as we try to work on this whole issue of housing uh, and reducing poverty in, in that particular neighborhood. So that's just a plug, but I certainly would invite you to get involved with that if you have an opportunity. And I, I, some of you are already involved. I'm, I'm not trying to pick anyone out, but I would, would appreciate if you would do that. I haven't said that. I'm going to ask other comments or questions by members of the council. Recognize Councilman Shule and then Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you all for coming out and talking about this important issue. Uh, it's a great concern of all of us as well. Um, as you know, right now, if you if you own a house in Durham worth two worth two hundred thousand dollars, you pay twenty dollars every year to help build a house for somebody else. Uh, we we do have a local tax that. Uh, that we levy uh, to do this. Um, and uh, one of the things we have done this year with the penny is we have extended the, uh, the length of time of the affordability of uh, quite a number of units uh, by, by use of the penny. Uh, Ms. Mack, where are you? Back there, thank you. So I think I agree this is a really important issue. Uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's a matter of money in that case. And uh, we, we were able to do that by using some of our local funds, as you know, uh, and including, uh, I believe a land trust, uh, was land trust property also one of those that we did that for, extended the, the uh, length of affordability, I believe it was. Um, I think that with the, with the reality that we face with the with a 9% tax credit and the new reality that we face with a 9% tax credit and the relative unavailability, the, 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 the fact that we're, we can get one of them probably every year and not more, uh, or very unlikely it will be more, uh, maybe two, uh, that we've got to come up with some other strategies because that has been a critical strategy. And I think there are some good strategies that are going around that I've heard and I would love to have some conversations with you all about them. Um, uh, but I, I want to say that the council's extremely concerned about it and, and, and very committed to trying to figure out a way to, to build affordable housing in the long term in the, in the transit areas, but also adding affordable units every year. Uh, we need to add affordable units every year. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Oh, um, like my colleague, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I think I'm aware, my colleagues are aware, that uh, stable housing is a first step uh, up out of poverty, the first step towards, um, for those that have substance abuse problems, to moving away from them, a step towards being able to um, hold, uh, get in, and hold jobs, the first step. And I think we all recognize the, the substantial needs, the fact that so many of you are here tonight just underscores that, and thank you for being here. Any other comments? If not, entertain a motion on the item before us. Second. It's been a proper move and second. I recognize uh, Larry Jarvis. Mayor yeah, Bell, there's specific. no action required. It's so just to hold the public hearing. Oh, we don't adopt anything. Okay, great. That's even better. <laughs> M Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll move that we accept the comments and thank people for being out here tonight. It's been properly moved and seconded by Councilman Moffitt and Councilwoman Katati. Uh, any further discussion? Here and uncalled a question, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. The last item we have before we go to the item that was pulled was the supplemental item, uh, Durham Chapel Hill, Carver, MPO Board Appointments. And the reason, again, I asked for this to be put on tonight rather than our regular work session Thursday is that we have a uh, board meeting, Chapel Hill, I mean, Durham Chapel Hill MPO board meets Wednesday and I wanted to have this change uh, done. So uh, you approve the priority item by the 
City Clerk, I would entertain a motion to approve the appointment. It's been properly moved and seconded that uh, Councilman Shule serve as the representative and myself serve as the alternate to the Chapel Hill Carver MPO board. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes six to zero. We will move back to item four, which was pulled. Uh, we had the person in the audience to pull the item, uh, Stephen Hopkins and Councilman Shule. Is Steve, Stephen here? This item is guidelines for dedicated funding source for funded small project development and neighborhood revitalization. And my comments are real short because uh, I don't know why I was trying to find the criteria that was being proposed and I couldn't. Uh, and uh, on process, uh, Council Mature, uh, what is the process in, in getting the criteria uh, established and picking the priorities. <laughs> Wait, Larry. Uh, good evening, uh, Larry Jarvis, Department of Community Development. The process for establishing the criteria is the one that we are going through tonight, where at the previous work session, Council reviewed the proposed uh, guidelines and uh, scoring criteria for the two new categories of funding that are being proposed, small project development and neighborhood revitalization. And tonight we're asking Council to approve those guidelines and those scoring criteria. And those will then be incorporated into the competitive application documents that we'll be releasing in the next few weeks, looking towards holding an application workshop uh, late October, early November. And, and, and that's the problem that I was having with it because I've been asking everybody, all of the housing folks that I know, if they had had input or even they had seen what had been proposed. And we haven't. And that's, that's just mine. I, mean, I just want to see it. So I, I would ask the council before you pass it to at least get it out to the housing folks and let us at least have a chance to look at it. Thank you. Let, let me ask, uh, that's, that's another Larry, what, what has been your source of input for these recommendations? Um, what we've done in the past is what we've done, what we're doing this year is to present uh, to council our recommended guidelines and the scoring criteria consistent with the funding plan that we had then presented to you in the spring where we uh, suggested funding by category. So we're asking you to be consistent tonight with the process that we've used in the past. I guess I'm trying to get to Steve's point has has anything been done externally other than what's been done internally to staff and developing this no okay uh, I'm gonna have a comment on that and we finish I recognize Councilman Steve he pulled sure he pulled that item thank you mr. mayor uh, I received as we all did today an email from Bo Glenn um, who uh, I'm gonna quote something from it I think raised an important point um, I would encourage an adjustment to the criteria to provide additional points for an affordable housing project that is within one half mile of a proposed transit station. I would incorporate your reasoning in your adopted resolution establishing the goal to preserve and increase the stock of affordable housing within a half mile of each of the proposed Durham Orange Rail Transit stations. He goes on to talk about the fact that TTA will be submitting a request next year uh, and that the, uh, the guidelines emphasize transit projects that protect and provide for affordable housing with ready access to transit transit will score higher and that uh, that local efforts in this regard are considered in the scoring uh, I thought this was a good point and I uh, spoke uh, with deputy city manager Keith Chadwell t this afternoon about it he called me and um, after exchanged some emails and so mr. Jarvis I was wondering if you all had a response to that or thoughts about how to handle that yes we do think it's a good idea to award bonus points if a project is located within the one half mile radius and what we would propose to do if we'll look first at the small project development category and then specifically uh, the project design and that would be 3D uh, where we were awarding eight points uh, based on uh, compatibility with adjacent land uses and proximity to commercial facilities and transportation. We would suggest there to reduce that to a maximum of four points and then add category E 
where a uh, project could get four bonus points if it's located within that one half mile radius. Then similarly with the uh, neighborhood revitalization category, uh, we would uh, redo the um, points that are possible for project design to again add an E to that that would have bonus points if a project is located within that one half mile radius. Did you say the number of bonus points in that second category? I may I, maybe I missed that. In the first one, it would be four bonus points. In the second one, since all of them are right now uh, five points each, probably what we would do is that to make it come out to still 20 points is reduce each one to four points. So the E, there would be four bonus points if you're located within that one half mile radius. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Jarvis. I think that sounds like a, a reasonable proposal, and I uh, appreciate you all responding to that today so quickly. Thank you. You had a quick comment. I, I, I have, have a comment, and I'm, I'm again, it's, it's not a public hearing, it's a public meeting. We, we took a big step when we did the one cents, and uh, we, we're trying to, to make sure we get it right. Uh, we, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Uh, Larry, I think you've done a, a super job. Unfortunately, I hate to see that you're going to be leaving while we're pulling this stuff together, but uh, you've done a super job in trying to pull this together. But I, I think we ought to take the one more step to let the public comment on what's being proposed. I, I'm not sure what the urgency is of uh, enacting this tonight. Maybe here, other than fact, you might be leaving, but uh, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is the timetable that we've got here on trying to get this, this piece adopted? We wanted to go ahead and get approval of this so we could do, put those application documents together and get them out there and allow uh, potential applicants plenty of time to look at getting uh, sites under option, that type of thing, so that we could receive uh, applications in the late um, December, early January time frame. So we didn't want to cut them too short in terms of the due diligence they would need to do. If you want to hold it uh, two weeks, uh, that's what we'll do. I, I, I personally feel more comfortable doing that. I mean, just as we got a recommendation this evening from Bo Glenn, who obviously has been involved in this and it seems to be reasonable. Uh, I, I just don't want the general public or the people who are supposedly in this housing community to say, you guys went out and adopted something without giving us an opportunity to have some input. And I know it could have had input tonight, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd feel more comfortable if we could just take a couple of weeks to allow that to happen. Uh, we've got a, we could adopt it at our next work, work session or we could adopt it at our next council meeting, but uh, I think it just gives people a little bit more time to, to at least have some comments on that. So that would be my, my recommendation to, to the council as, as we move forward on, on this particular item. Again, I don't have a timetable, but. Well, what we can do is, since this is still in our queue, mm -hmm. is that we can go ahead in the uh, one base system and make the proposed edits and then um, continue however you want to handle it. Okay. Recognize. Okay. If, if that's the recognized Councilman Moffitt. And can I add, uh, just so that I'm clear, when you talk about, when you talk about um, taking a little bit of time to do this, are you thinking of public hearing at our next, uh, our next business meeting? I guess what I'm thinking is that uh, the document is, will be put out for the public. Uh, if people have a, want to make comments, they can forward their comments into the staff, and you can take that in consideration as you bring the document back, back to us. I'm not trying to get into another public meeting, but just as Bo Glenn saw something and he wrote it, uh, these people aren't dummies out here. They, they, I don't, when I say that, I don't mean that. Uh, but they have an opportunity. If, if you want to uh, make comments, uh, there's a vehicle for doing that, send it into the uh, housing, uh, development department where Larry is and he can incorporate those as he sees fit into the document and bring it back to us. So I'm not trying, trying to get into another public No, that's meeting, fine. You know. We will make those changes and I'll then send it out by, to our listserv because okay. I think everybody that you know is here tonight is definitely on the listserv and yeah. it's pretty wide distribution. Okay. And it doesn't mean because you make a, a recommendation it's going to be adopted, but the fact is you have an opportunity to bring something in, but still 
up to the council to make the final decision on how, what, what this is going to be. Uh, if that's okay, I, uh, could I have a motion to just continue this until this October 23rd? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. The 23rd work session, you and I are going to be It passes there. six to zero. Okay, okay. thank you. Come see me in Raleigh. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, Larry, thank you. Any other items to come before the council uh, before we adjourn? If not, the council is adjourned at 9.03 p.m.